move your corn-fed Midwestern lot ass farm boy. <laughs> It was good. Uh, there was a lot of good stuff for him to riff on in that section. Yep. He's good when he gets going, you know. Mm. Alan's funny. We talked about websites. <laughs> talked about websites. <laughs> that sounds... Websites are a common interest of ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah. But maybe my favorite thing now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at one right now. Gotta check my sites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Natalie has a very good website as well uh, for... Oh, yeah. Please um, listen to the Toxic Feminine Mystique episode about mommy blogs and go to rockhardmamas.com. And it's a <laughs> it's a satire of mommy blogs, and I'm really proud of it. So hmm. if you aren't a patron, why? But also you can still go see the website. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, and I guess that means we've started the episode. So welcome to Rock Hard Caucus. Hi. We got the founding caucus members here. The four founding fathers. Four Natalie, do you, do you object to being called that? Yeah, I object to no. it. I don't want to be associated with any founding fathers. I know it's like mankind. When you say yeah. founding fathers, you mean everyone. Yeah, and fathers, I feel fine yeah. about sure. that. Sure, yep, yeah. I feel fine. Gender neutral fathers. Yes. Of all colors, too. Sure. <laughs> Um, before we get into the meat of today's episode, I do want to acknowledge one thing. This is the 100th Rock Hard Caucus recording. It's is not it? the 100th episode, but it's the 100th thing we've recorded. Wow. Yeah. Damn. So that includes like every numbered episode, the like short stuff that's come out, and then every Patreon thing. Holy shit. Really? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably be the 99th release because the thing I recorded yesterday, I think I'm going to finish after this. But we've done it. 100 recordings today. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> Dang. Forever known as podcast how many, people. So do you have any, I guess, do you know how many hours of audio that you've edited doing this show, do you think? Uh, I could figure that out, but it's I have it all together in a folder. <laughs> Man, Justin does so much work. Listeners, Justin does so much work and we do nothing. <laughs> this is pretty much his podcast. Like, I I don't think any of us have taken a fucking penny from this show. And I, like, I don't think, I mean, I don't want any. I don't like <laughs> yeah. I show up for like an hour and a half, like twice a month anymore. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm calculating the number of hours in the folder here. Uh, okay, so this includes everything up until Toxic Feminine Mystique 8, the Rock Hard Mamas episode. There's also teasers in here, so that'll add like a few extra minutes. But the total in this folder is five days and about five hours of audio. Wow. (laughs) So that's 65 hours, I believe. We have so many good Toxic Feminine Mystiques coming up, like Rock Hard Mama's level good. So please become a patron because we have really good stuff coming. Oh, I did the math extremely wrong on that. It's 125 hours. Sorry. (laughs) 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 Yep. I did 5 times 12 instead of 5 times 24. Whoops. Soon will be a Sopranos podcast also. (laughs) (laughs) I did mention the Sopranos on yesterday's recording with Alan. You mentioned it the last show that I was on too on the (laughs) Slipknot episode. I need to rewatch that shit. I mean, I've I've never finished it actually. but And Stella just watched it too, so she'll probably want to talk about it. (laughs) No, I'll set that one out. The only time that I ever... Well, I guess the only time that I was had it running with the cops where I was actually like booked. We were watching the Sopranos. Weird. I was at my, I was at my buddy's apartment <laughs> and we were, we were smoking weed and like a lot of it on the ground floor. And the person that owned the building was like showing apartments that day. And I guess that like, oh, they no. got, yeah, well they'd gotten pretty sick of us because um, like he was just, he's like a trust fund kid. And like he got his first big check when he turned 18 from his dad and uh he used it to like rent an apartment and like buy a bunch of pot and like buy a big tv and like an xbox and a playstation 3 and like (laughs) a big couch and like a big bed oh man you have good friends it wouldn't have been a playstation 3 back then (laughs) whatever it was it was an xbox 360 and a a ps yes it would have been yeah because the ps2 came out alongside the gamecube anyway no you said ps3 anyway i did say ps3 (laughs) yeah he had an Xbox 360 and he had a PS3. 
This come out at the same time, I think, right? Yeah, like around 2006. Yeah, because the so. PS4 came out with the uh, Xbox One, and then the PS5, whatever. Anyways, <laughs> regardless, um, we, I mean, he was like an obnoxious neighbor, obviously, because he was like staying up all night and gaming and like getting high and then filling the apartment with weed smoke. And like they were showing apartments that day, and like they called the cops, and the cops came. And he just opened the door when someone knocked on it, and they're just like standing there, and like there's just shit everywhere in his apartment. And we were watching The Sopranos, and uh, they came in, and uh, they were like, you know, what's going on here, blah blah blah, and like we were just fucked instantly, obviously. <laughs> and like I had this nervous habit of putting my hands in my pockets. And I kept doing that, and for some reason that was making them nervous, the cops, that I just yeah. kept putting my hands in my pockets, even though I was like. 15 and like maybe like 140 pounds soaking wet like <laughs> you know six foot whatever so they made me sit on the floor in the kitchen which was disgusting with these oh little God, tiny of course it was yeah oh. they put me they put me in cuffs because i kept i mean they didn't make him wear cuffs or the other guy that was with us they made me wear this little set of cuffs that didn't have like a chain on it you know it was just like <laughs> one solid yeah um and i'm just sitting there on the fucking floor in the apartment <laughs> And I think we sat there for at least an hour and a half while they were, like, waiting for, like... It was, like, pretty late at night. Like, they are waiting for, like, a warrant to get, like, written up and signed by a judge and brought out. So I'm just literally sitting on the fucking floor. Like, we're all just sitting there. There's three cops. There's me, my friend, my other friend, <laughs> and me on the floor. And we're just sitting there all watching The Sopranos with these cops for, like, an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I think of that show, that's all I can think of is just being on that fucking floor what and watching fuck? that show for an hour and a half. I didn't even like it to begin with. And like then I was like stuck like watching it with these cops. And then my buddy's like, asked one of them, he's like, do you care if I smoke a cigarette in here? And he let him, which was pretty nice of him, I think. But <laughs> it was you're awful. Like tie, you're like tied to this brand. I was like a clockwork orange. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. But God. Well, sorry. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't oh know you had God. a traumatic experience experience associated did, with yeah. the show oh my god i bet yeah. the floor was so bad <laughs> it was god, bad because it was like an 18 year old kid's first apartment the kitchen uh, floor in there uh, and like <laughs> and then as soon as like all the podcasters were like hey guys go watch the sopranos uh then i was like no like i don't want this discourse on my timeline all the time so please respect my lived experience your trauma <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> All right, well, today we'll be cementing another piece of the Rock Hard Caucus legacy. You may recall way back, I think this is probably like our second or third episode. Um, yeah. We may have had something to do with Joseph Dobrian's writing career coming to an end <laughs> at the press yeah. citizen. <laughs> One of us. <laughs> mm, okay. Oh, <laughs> I think it was me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it was me. I reached Cancel out culture. Yeah. Yeah, Cancel I culture canceled. found Joseph Dobrian. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Canceling those people who like pubic hair too much. Yeah. We <laughs> found them. Porn much. tweets. Yeah. We found him tweeting about how, like, oh, what did he say? Abhor the baldy. Yeah. <laughs> Abhor the baldy. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and I sent it to the press. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you may also recall that uh, sometime last summer, Evan and I tore apart a Joel Curtinitis piece, and Joel has not written anything since then. Oh, I have plenty of ammunition on Joel. I have a recorded interview with him where I could, <laughs> if I needed oh, to, I forgot about that. Uh, so you know, do I. At least damaging information about him, but I don't need to because Joel is apparently out of the game and uh, yeah. just like languishing on Twitter, posting the most boring takes. <laughs> like for zero engagement and bleeding followers constantly. Mm -hmm. So everyone we make fun of seems to retire from writing, and uh, we got another one this week. Have you seen Joel Curtinitis' uh, header on his Twitter account? I don't remember. No, it's like a grainy, like JPEG artifact laden image of him playing chess with Ted Cruz <laughs> oh, in 2015. Right. Oh my god! <laughs> yep. Damn, dude. <laughs> yeah. Which I love. It's a very cool picture. Yeah. He's playing with the Grandmaster. He's learning from <laughs> <laughs> Grand Champ Ted Cruz. Of course, Ted Cruz is a fucking chess guy. Yeah. <laughs> By your loan logic, sir. I have checkmated you. <laughs> <laughs> King I might have said it in chat the other day, but I've decided that I'm not going to use the phrase checkmate anymore. I'm going to start saying king me instead, which is much funnier because I think it's more embarrassing to get beaten in checkers than chess. <laughs> 
I suggest everyone listening do the same online when engaged in a battle of logic <laughs> and you inevitably win. So we took out Dobrin, we took out Curtinitis, and we got another one. Dennis Clayson has decided to stop writing for the Waterloo Cedar Falls Courier. Another scalp for the wall. I love it. We did it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, listeners will know Dennis Clayson from his infamous Toxic Feminine Mystique article, which we read on Stella's first episode, and then stole the title of for <laughs> Natalie and Stella's uh, <laughs> Patreon series. So Dennis is, a, yeah, he's a big part of our show, actually. I didn't realize he, he invented TFM. He did, yeah. He named it for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was about the copier. Oh my god, it was the copier. Yeah, yeah, that that was him. <laughs> <laughs> For people who didn't listen back then, he made an incredibly petty grievance article about how, like, what was it? It was, it was like women don't fix the copier at work. <laughs> and yeah. women don't That's, fix the copier. Yes. At work That's one thing that. about women is that they never be fixing the copier at work. <laughs> 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 and that's why fe- that's why femininity is but, toxic. <laughs> but men, can, they can fix a copier, no problem. Simple. Yeah. Dennis is a marketing professor at the University of Northern Iowa, and he seems to hate all of his colleagues, all of his bosses, all of his students. <laughs> he seems to <laughs> be <laughs> rocks, just pissed <laughs> off all the time. He's a pretty standard conservative in his writing. Yeah, full of resentments, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, let me read from his final column, which came out on the 11th. Dennis Clayson bids Courier readers farewell. I have been writing for The Courier for 25 years. By my calculation, this is Article 1301. Oh my God. And it is my last. (laughs) (laughs) When Saul Shapiro was executive editor of The Courier, he decided there should be a conservative balance to longstanding columnist Scott Kowelty. For years, Kowalti appeared on the left side of the page, and I was on the right side. Isn't that cute? Ha ha. (laughs) I don't know how balanced it was, since Scott is a person with many talents, but it was fun. When I was interviewed by the University of Northern Iowa, Steve Corbin took me out to see a musical group called Winter Ridge Handy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Who gives a fuck, dude? <laughs> this is very insider baseball right now. Yeah. Well, he brought it up because I guess Scott Kowalty is in that band. <laughs> uh, since Kowalty worked at UNI, occasionally someone would ask if we talked often. No. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> End of paragraph. <laughs> is that really the end of the paragraph? <laughs> yeah. It's just like people often ask if uh, I talk to this guy, and uh, no, I don't. (laughs) And a few words. (laughs) When my articles first appeared, some sensitive souls took offense and threatened never to read the courier again. Sensitive (laughs) souls. Shapiro handled it calmly, suggesting to disgruntled readers that it was a wash. My articles attracted as many readers as were put off. Uh, That's possibly true. I don't know. Early on, I decided to live by three rules. First, I would write what I was interested in, not what someone else thought should be written. Second, I would not read reactions to my columns unless a real name was attached. He knows not to feed the trolls. Smart. Yeah, this just reads just like a vengeful blog post. (laughs) (laughs) It really does. Uh, Third, I would never attack anyone by name who lived in the Cedar Valley. This is my code. <laughs> a man has but to have a code. Do, if you don't live in the Cedar Valley, you're, you're ruthless. Free yeah. <laughs> and it, I mean, he's pretty fucking <laughs> critical of everyone around him. He just doesn't use their names. Uh, being a conservative writer at a university was interesting. Most people treated me well. The people I worked with were consistently kind, even though an occasional liberal professor would have a few problems. (laughs) Sounds like he's the one with the problem to me. (laughs) (laughs) UNI's official reaction was to completely ignore the column. In terms of being a columnist for a local newspaper, I did not exist. I think that would be preferable. I don't really want my employer acknowledging this podcast, for instance. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Writing these weekly columns has been a lot of fun. It has forced me to think more deeply about the events of the day and about numerous other issues, both from practical and philosophical viewpoints, and sometimes even spiritual. (laughs) It has been fun to create fictional characters who I will miss. (laughs) 
This what? is something we, we have not encountered in our previous readings of Dennis. Does he like make up a guy and then get mad at him? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure he does. Every, all of these guys do that. <laughs> or the Chuck Schumer route of making up guys who agree with you. Yes. Like the <laughs> imaginary <laughs> middle American family. Yes. Like making yeah. up a guy to get mad at is like you have to do that to have any longevity in <laughs> the type of writing that Clayson did. Yeah, you don't get to 1,300 articles without doing a little fiction. <laughs> yes. Uh, he gives two examples. There was Senator Snort, the prototypical uh- politician. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But my favorite character was Justin Case. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. <laughs> this guy is so fucking clever, dude. <laughs> The UNI artist who became an international celebrity for starting a movement called refusalism. <laughs> Since modern art is typically without skill and with oh the Oh my god. <laughs> I hate this take. And with the art community affirming only an artist could produce art, Case correctly concluded that only the conception of art could be real. Therefore, only in the refusal to produce art could true art be achieved. Oh, wow. What a God. whopper of a take. Just biting satire here. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Hell yeah. Art isn't real, <laughs> says the marketing professor. <laughs> Ooh, wow. Well, what a, yeah. right. <laughs> of course, this philosophy spread. Teachers unions concluded that only in the refusal to teach could true teaching be realized. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like the freshman philosopher? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad his time writing for the newspaper has, like, <laughs> like you said, broadened his, like, <laughs> you know, th- made him think. It yeah, made clearly. him think. His brain tripled in size over the course of his writing career. <laughs> he had a little bit too much free reign, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, where are his editors? Like, sure, a conservative guy has insane grievances and invents people to be mad at, but where the fuck are the editors who are like, no, you can't do this? (laughs) This sucks. (laughs) This isn't good and no one likes it. (laughs) Isn't uh, what he just said about, like, only in the refusal to teach could true teaching be realized? Isn't that just like the Socratic method, basically? (laughs) This does sound very Dobrain S too, because it's like, yeah. yeah, this is like a self-insertion guy who's like, wow, everyone just, he, he was an academic and everyone, like, academics, like, don't get fame ever, like, unless mm. they're like Neil Tyson. He's kind of a Roger Ballou in real life. Yeah. <laughs> Although I don't think he tried to fuck his students. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, But at some point, we know we are not as smart as we once were, and change rolls around all too quickly. So I guess he thinks he's losing his edge, and that's why he's quitting. Uh, Lauren Isley once wrote, I myself, like others of my generation, was born in an age which has already perished. At my death, I will look my last upon a nation which, save for some linguistic continuity, will seem increasingly alien and remote. It will be as though I peered upon my youth through misty centuries. <laughs> I hate people who use, like, who write in more complicated ways. Like, you could say, despite the fact that we still use English, our word, you know, it's just like, yeah. I just hate saying, like, the, like, choose the simplest word. Fuck off. The world has passed him on, it sounds like. He no longer knows how to engage with these people. <laughs> He's Dr. Manhattan. (laughs) For two and a half increasingly misty decades, I thank you. And that's how he leaves us. Wait, that's the end? Yeah, Clayson writes for the courier no more. He has made his exit. Wonder who they're going to replace him with. Sounds pretty much as bitter as always in those final paragraphs. I'm not as smart as I once were, and, and the world is too different now. It's not like when I was a kid, dang it. So I decided uh, I should take a look back at his career since he's been writing for this paper for 25 years. We should give him a proper send off on the show. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm certain that we're the ones who convinced him to quit. (laughs) Uh, The first his oldest article that I could find on the Courier's website is from August 2000. So he said he'd been writing for them for 25 years. I'm not going to pay for like an archives subscription to this paper <laughs> just, just to <laughs> read the very first Clayson, but uh, I can give you a little bit of his, the first, the oldest one I can find. It's about food. For most of history, the family that wanted to eat a chicken had to kill a chicken. 
If you wanted to be warm or cook your food, you had oh to make God. a fire, and you oh. had to gather the wood for that fire. <laughs> I know what's coming here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really need to read the whole thing, but I can give you oh. little bits. I mean, because it's predictable. You know what it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does everyone soft now? Pretty much. People don't deserve welfare, basically. <laughs> These are lessons that the spoiled citizens of first world countries seem to have forgotten. <laughs> Isn't it good for people to to forget what it's like to like <laughs> brutally labor every second? Yeah, the marketing professor and newspaper columnist is a like real hunter gatherer <laughs> type. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we want both the chicken dinner and the eggs, and we never want to see the blood. That's the problem with kids today. Yeah. <laughs> no one wants to see how the sausage is made. <laughs> I think there's a little something to be said for that, though. Like as far as um being in denial about our food systems but that's not what he's saying yeah right, he's saying <laughs> absolutely not <laughs> yeah, not that right. you should not that you should change your desires but you should uh you should want to see the blood as well it's right. wrong not to want to see that <laughs> <laughs> fucked up <laughs> <laughs> and then he talks a little bit about like energy uh the nations indeed the world's need for electricity is growing faster than the generation capacity as little as 20 years ago, the nation generated up to 30% more electricity than needed. Now that figure is 14%, and by 2005, it could fall below 10%. Surpluses at this level now trigger automatic warnings of near brownout conditions. So should we change our energy system? system? Dennis, what do you think? In 1980, 51% of electrical power in America was produced from coal. That figure is now 56%. 20 years ago, 11% of our electricity came from nuclear power plants. That figure is now close to 22%, and about 11% of our power comes from hydro sources. He talks about how we're becoming more dependent on coal, but I'll give him credit for this. He does recognize that coal is a pollutant and probably bad he even used the word global warming in the year 2000 as a conservative wow so they okay they used to be more the nor- they used to be more normal though mm, not in 2000 in, when it comes to global warming <laughs> oh yeah because that would have been oil war time okay but like before that there was a little bit more like everyone accepting the science at some point i think it was probably less of a like cultural war shit yeah, yeah. that yeah that's the point a I'm little trying bit to make. less yeah, yeah it, it became more polarized in a couple of years following this. Yeah, it was just pre, like, Al Gore <laughs> coming out. Mm-hmm. Like, right before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he bitches about how environmentalists don't want more nuclear power. Interestingly, he never mentions wind power, which, of course, has grown immensely since Especially in Iowa. Yeah. He also, also nothing about uh, solar. He didn't anticipate the emergence of Bitcoin, which uh, leads to very <laughs> essential <laughs> uses of energy. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't realize that the demand for energy was going to increase in that way. Uh, it's standard shit where he's just like bitching about how people want to be comfortable, but they they also don't want to ruin <laughs> the environment, which is a conflict, I guess. He ends with, the spoiled children of the modern nation states have some hard decisions to make. That's it? Yeah. That's it? Well, I mean, I skipped a lot of it, but, I mean, that's true. But that's (laughs) how it ends? Yes, that is the final sentence. What is he suggesting the decision is? Uh, He doesn't really provide any solution. (laughs) He's just, like, (laughs) fucking farting onto whatever publication he's writing. Like, I don't... It seems to basically be, quit your bitching. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't see it, like any value whatsoever in like anything <laughs> publishing this or like giving this any space but okay <laughs> and i took a screenshot here to give you a sample of his early headlines uh so here's a bunch of stuff from january 2001 why have discrimination laws at all <laughs> <laughs> if you can't get the women to fix the goddamn copiers <laughs> <laughs> a long-awaited goodbye to bill clinton Okay. <laughs> Lefts find good in position until it works for other side. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know what the fuck that means. <laughs> Is this a riddle? <laughs> <laughs> What's in my pocket? <laughs> One of you lies and the other always tells the truth. <laughs> Patching like a, a giant stone Dennis Clayson Sphinx <laughs> asking me that riddle. <laughs> Uh, compassion labels are just an illusion. 
<laughs> sure, <laughs> whatever. What's the compassion label? <laughs> Governor Vilsack missing economic realities. Okay, okay. It's pretty standard. Without context, I probably agree. And then both parties are lying to us about tax cuts. True. Also yeah. probably true. <laughs> yeah. But... I'm, Maybe I'm, not in the way he. Yeah. Right. We'll, we'll see what he. <laughs> we'll see what he has to say. But okay, so you remember I was talking about uh, refusalism, that artist who thinks that <laughs> yeah. only the concept of art is art. Well, I found one of his writings about that character from 2001, and uh, yeah, Natalie, you were tweeting about uh, people who hate art recently, so I figured you would enjoy this. <laughs> it makes me so angry. Modern art is cool. Stop saying that it's just a black square and you could do it, because like you probably can't. Like <laughs> <laughs> I could. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the one you were talking about was about Rothko, and that shit was like fifty plus years ago, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like the one of it's like one of the original conservative grievance bullshit is yeah. that like modern art sucks and like children can do it. Well, then yeah. why did the CIA fund it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a the bit of truth there is that like the economics surrounding art and like who yes, is able to live yes. off of art is a fucking scam, but. The art itself, like, whatever. It's just art. (laughs) Nothing to get upset about. Okay, well, here's uh, Dennis writing about refusalism. This isn't his first piece about the artist, just in case. (sighs) (laughs) But it's an update about... Just in case? Yeah, that's that's the name of his artist, just in case. Hell yeah. Mm -hmm. This is how just in case adapted to the Bush administration. Now that a Republican is in the White House, it is time again to check in on Cedar Falls' own Justin Case. Those who read this column regularly, and those in the state's art community, remember Case. Mm. (laughs) Maybe over-exaggerating your own audience there. (laughs) Overestimating your reach. Uh, He is the artist who became an international art celeb by creating an entirely new art form. And then he just repeats the shit he said before, art doesn't take any skill, uh... (laughs) Uh, just, Justin became disillusioned and almost became a stockbroker. He was saved by a revelation he came to one day while chained to a Volkswagen with his face painted blue, doing a piece of performance art. <laughs> Is that How just absurd. like a Mad Lib that he pulled to <laughs> get to that spot? I'm guessing so. Performance art also cool. Art it's so is goofy. Cool. They paint their it is, faces. It is cool to do art. Art I is think good he's, for you. I, I just don't think he understands the concept of self-expression. Because <laughs> that doesn't have a purpose. It has to have a defined purpose you can't for it to have just, value. You can't just do something for the joy of it and right. to create. It's good to create. There's no such thing as bad art, in my opinion. Oh, yes, yeah. there is. <laughs> I mean, I know that it can, like, it's not that the art can't be bad. It's no such thing as a bad reason to do it. No matter what turns out, it's good for your soul. I um, believe have in you heard this. of yes. Lenny Riefenstahl? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. You, you get what my point. What about Allen? Uh, fuck off. You get my <laughs> point. God. <laughs> no, I do. There's a, there's a museum of bad art in Boston that I went to a couple times, and I love it. Yeah, you had an exhibit yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> Outsider art is, yeah, it's cool. A lot of yeah, it. I like, love that it's, shit. It's like absolutely, I mean, there is bad art that looks bad, but it's not like the process of creating is never bad, in my opinion. It's good for you to make things, no matter how they turn out. I make the most garbage shit every single day, <laughs> and it's good for you, and it's beautiful to express yourself no matter what the final product is. Yeah, I'm going to mail Dennis a CD of my music and see what he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell him it's in the line of refusal. Like, it's you're inspired by refu- refusalism. Yeah, yeah. He would, be he would so probably happy. buy it. Yeah, he would be like, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Justin Case's vision is only in the refusal to produce art could art be truly realized. I wonder if Dennis has ever heard of John Cage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Justin Case produces shows in which he mentally visualizes each piece of art, but refuses to produce any of it. His displays are blank walls with little plaques that explain what each piece would be if it had been produced. I would go see that. <laughs> I would go see that. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> There's real exhibits kind of like that. Yeah. There are real stuff. And fuck off. It's interesting. <laughs> like... <laughs> 
Well, he's saying this guy got super famous. <laughs> right, yeah. He says that it, it spread to like New York and L.A. and other artists took up the banner of refusalism. Sounds like a win to well, me. Well, you can only do that once. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, according to Art Iowa, the premier art magazine in the state, which I think he made up, but it's not a very creative name, Dennis. Art, Iowa. Uh, Justin Case has not received a government grant to produce refusalist art since Bush became president. <laughs> a small group of refusalist devotees stood in a rainstorm in front of the White House in April to protest and to demand that the government again fund refusalist art. Okay, so this is about <laughs> the National Endowment for the Arts. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, skipping ahead a bit, the main topic of discussion was the National Endowment of the Arts refusal <laughs> to consider giving grants <laughs> to produce Deadly refusalist off the art. Top rope. Now you'll love this joke too. Uh, Maggie <laughs> Smith Jones Hopton Dillon. That's all <laughs> oh, hyphenated names. Because feminists. Because <laughs> yeah. feminists. Yep, yep. They like to keep their last names, which is disgusting. <laughs> she, and it looks like she must have gotten married at least three times. <laughs> <laughs> or she's polyamorous. Or she's <laughs> yeah. from a long line of feminists. Mm-hmm. Which is like the worst thing that you could be. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was the president of the organization's feminist council. She proclaimed that the Bush administration's policies amounted to a return to barbarism. Jesus Christ. I'd say for the most part, she's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, Justin Case came under intense criticism because of an art piece he produced this spring. The piece of art consisted of a mathematically perfect four-sided 10-foot high pyramid made from honeydew melons covered with chocolate and topped with a large plastic and neon-lighted maraschino cherry. That Hell sounds yeah. I'll go see it. sick, dude. <laughs> I would love to see that. <laughs> Even with Case's warning that the piece would have to be refrigerated soon, enthusiasts bid up the value to its final selling price of $186,563, which for... A 10-foot-high pyramid seems pretty cheap when it comes to a famous artist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, the whole thing there is that uh, Justin Case has uh, betrayed his refusalist followers in actually producing a piece of art. It's, it's high satire here. Art Iowa, that publication that he made up, called Case a traitor with the reactionary instincts of a Norman Rockwell. <laughs> what? <laughs> So, I, I mean, I assume Clayson loves Norman Rockwell, one of the most boring artists of all time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I changed my mind. There is bad art. <laughs> uh, and then, the, uh, skipping again, he ends with, Justin shrugged. I am still absolutely committed to refusalist art. Just yesterday, I produced a piece that will not be shown in L.A. next summer. The critics are very enthusiastic about it, and so am I. Zero comments on this article. <laughs> He's making big waves. <laughs> was this the only thing that Clayson did? Like, did he just like write as like a, a hobby and then have a regular job too, or did he literally make a career out of writing shit like this? I assume they paid him at least a little bit because like a column a week is a lot of writing. Yeah, a thousand columns or whatever. Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Thirteen hundred. But he was a marketing professor. Oh right, yeah, of you course. and I. Yeah. I assume he has some sort of uh, feud with an art professor there. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, it's a personal. <laughs> it's personal. And I can guarantee you the art professor has no idea this feud exists. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, and actually, kind of a little bit keeping in theme with his uh, art criticism, I have a pair of articles here. The first one he published in 2003, and <laughs> the headline is, Seabiscuit Provides Food for Thought About Welfare. <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> what? The, yeah. Is he talking uh, about the what? that? Like, Are we going to read this one? The movie the about a horse. <laughs> yeah. That's a, Seabiscuit, um, wasn't Seabiscuit a triple crown winner? Yeah. I haven't seen the movie, but doesn't it's Tobey Maguire, right? He's the jockey? I think that's right. I haven't seen it either. It sounds like the most middle brow thing ever, but... Didn't it win an Oscar for, like, Best Picture or something? It might have. I'm sure. Have you seen it, Natalie? No. Okay, so none of us have seen it, but we're going to read Dennis's <laughs> thoughts here. But we all already have I know the general, <laughs> the general idea, but... Yeah, it's based on a real horse, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only person I remember from 
seeing ads for that was Jeff Bridges, I think, was in that movie. Right, right. Well, here are Dennis's thoughts from shortly after the movie premiered. I was watching the movie Seabiscuit when I had an epiphany of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to me all the time. <laughs> when you're watching Seabiscuit. Yeah, <laughs> when I'm doing my weekly Seabiscuit watch. <laughs> The movie used the theme throughout that the success of this racehorse was seen as a positive symbol of hope for those who suffered during the Great Depression. The point was pounded into the audience at regular intervals, but one dramatic moment was particularly obvious. The storyline was literally interrupted while the screen showed children sleeping in clean beds, workers being fed, and medical care being administered to the poor. Oh, that sounds very good. (laughs) I cannot wait to, for him to explain to me why it's actually bad. <laughs> oh <boy. laughs> Over these scenes, a picture of President Franklin D. Roosevelt was superimposed while the narrator informed us that someone finally cared. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that does sound like, pretty hey, cheesy. <laughs> it does. The anti-New Deal people are incredible. Who are like, <laughs> there are people today who are against the New Deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're called all the elected representatives of this country. That's true. You're right. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, no professional would use propaganda this crude. It dawned on me that, as incredible as it may sound, the Hollywood writers and producers, and probably even many in the audience, actually believed this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> They actually believe that Roosevelt saved the poor, and by extension, that large government programs are the saviors of the downtrodden. Incredible. It is amazing that educated people at this time in history still are firmly attached to this myth. Good article, Dennis. Yeah, that's (laughs) just good so far. At a private college back east, I came upon two theology professors talking about government welfare programs. Here we go again, academic feuds <laughs> that just fuel all of his writing. They were expressing surprise that some people actually opposed these programs. Since they both knew me, I said I was opposed to most government welfare schemes. <laughs> Social security is a pyramid scheme. Pass it on. <laughs> They looked at me for a moment in shocked silence. I don't think they had ever heard a professor express such a view. Good. Uh, yeah, no one's ev- ever heard of a conservative professor. You're the <laughs> only one, dude. They then asked me if I wanted the poor to return to the bad old days. I could see visions of ragged children selling matches on fog-draped city streets. <laughs> you, you live in London or something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds very yeah. Victorian England. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, The assumption of their question was that the government was the savior of the poor, a rather blasphemous position for professors of religion to make. What the fuck? (laughs) We're taking an interesting turn now. (laughs) I asked them what evidence they had that the poor now, after 70 years of large government welfare programs, are better off than they would be if the programs had never existed. Anyone feel like he's missing some context over the (laughs) 70 years in between those times? Perhaps. (laughs) The New Deal started and it just stayed the same size the whole time. Yeah. (laughs) It was not a change in thinking or ideology at all. Those programs were never sabotaged, shrunk in any way. Well, the professors that he was debating had no evidence against his uh, claim here. Obviously, they had never entertained the idea before. They simply made the automatic assumption made by the writers and directors of Seabiscuit. (laughs) (laughs) Hollywood. (laughs) Trying to fucking indoctrinate you with their horse movies. Yeah, they bring the kids in with the the horse, and then they (laughs) trick them. (laughs) The kids love horses. They do be loving horses, though. They love historical dramas, also. (laughs) There's nothing children love more than historical dramas about the Great Depression. (laughs) (laughs) Many economists and historians believe that the Roosevelt programs during the Great Depression deepened the problem and extended it. Um, Yeah, many economists do. Because economists are fucking stupid. Because <laughs> they're economists, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is little evidence that the Depression would have ever ended under these programs without World War II intervening. These researchers maintain that the economic pain experienced during the era was unnecessary. I would maintain the same thing. <laughs> I think yeah. That, <laughs> much what of the, the fuck? Much of Why the pain we be... experience is unnecessary. 
Uh, rather, government intervention contributed to the problem that would have resolved itself in a few years. <laughs> We could have just had Hoover too, and that would have solved the whole thing. Do nothing, and the Great Depression will resolve itself. I trust Americans to work their way out of a tight spot. <laughs> I always wish that somehow there was a way to show what would have happened if they do. Like I think of like Adam Sullivan tweeting abolish the FDA, and like <laughs> yeah. I was just there. I wish there was a way to show a future where that happens, but like. I don't want it to happen so vehemently that I can't say that. But just right. like, do you understand how many like birth defects and exploded hearts will happen <laughs> if there's like no <laughs> no oversight of drugs? Like, well, yeah, I mean, you can point to like every other example of deregulation and the resulting disasters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess there's nothing you can do to convince these people right, about yeah. how stupid their ideas are. Well, I mean, there are some countries that don't have like a uh, regulatory approval process for that right. kind of thing uh off the top of my head i can't really think of any but there are definitely i know i know haiti for one doesn't have anything like an fda or anything like that mm -hmm. i mean there's plenty of places around the world that our friend can move to to <laughs> escape the tyranny of the government <laughs> and from what i understand there's also very little i think maybe no uh income tax at all in somalia he could move <laughs> yeah. there if he wants. If you, if you I, hate I don't America think, so much. I don't think you want to move to either of those countries to escape the tyranny of the U.S. government. I mean, <laughs> good point. <yeah. laughs> good point. <laughs> don't, don't tell him that. Just tell him there's no taxes there. <laughs> yeah. A while back, Charles Murray studied the influence of government social oh policy God. on America's minorities. <laughs> on America's minorities. <laughs> friend of the show i had to read that one quick just to make sure it could get out of my mouth without <laughs> throwing up <clears throat> he found that on almost all indicators minorities were worse off than they would have been even under the least promising predictions made before the great society of the 1960s the only exception was the percent of minorities enrolled in college and homicide rates that were close to the pessimistic predictions Unemployment, labor force participation, teenage unemployment, single-parent households, and illegitimate births all fell through the floor from anything... Oh, no, not <laughs> illegitimate births. Yeah, even the most pessimistic trends before the Great Society would have predicted. So, yes, we're going to draw on the, the studies of Charles Murray to <laughs> talk about... Jesus oh, Christ. <laughs> Uh, many writers have pointed out that if we were truly a compassionate nation, we would drop most of these programs for the poor immediately. <laughs> <laughs> In their isolation, many on the left and many moderates have never questioned the societal myths that drive so much of the nation's thinking on these matters. To be blunt, the beneficiaries of most governmental wealth transfer plans are bureaucrats and political demagogues. The other beneficiaries are the educational elites and the upper middle class who support these programs because it lets them live with a clear conscience. The educational elites, Dennis? <laughs> <laughs> How do you become one of those? Does, does this imply that Dennis does not live with a clear conscience? <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Because all of his writing seems to indicate he doesn't find any faults with himself or his own thoughts. <laughs> Not much self-criticism here. It allows them to believe they are good people. They care. They are doing something. They can walk past the poor on the street because they give the government huge amounts of wealth to take care of the poor. Uh, I skipped over some typographical errors in that sentence. Just trust me, it was worse than what I said. They can walk past the injured and the sick because they have paid for the ambulances. By God, they have paid. Okay, Dennis, who do you uh, give your money out to in the street, huh? Do you just pass the homeless or do you give them what's in your wallet? I have a guess as to what you do when you see someone <laughs> on the street. <laughs> they elect people who let them believe they have fulfilled their obligation to the poor, the sick, and the aged because they are willing to pay higher taxes. Sitting in the darkened theater, I realize that the Hollywood types know their audience. They are all true believers. Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's how he ends it. And... To a point, I agree with I was like, say, some yeah, of what he's saying there. Some of it. We aren't fulfilling our obligations to the poor with governmental programs because those governmental programs should be bigger and more wide-reaching than they are. 
And like, yeah, liberals do absolve themselves and yeah. do do half measures in order to attempt to like have a clear conscience at night, and they don't give money to panhandlers. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah, because they that's because they feel pressure from conservative people and the influence of like conservative thought. Yes. Yes. yes, absolutely. And like people like Dennis have the same excuses for not helping people. They're like, oh, well, I, I pay taxes. I'm a taxpayer. In fact, they say that more often than liberals. <laughs> yes. It's one of my favorite things to say, ironically. Because you're a taxpayer? <laughs> that I fucking pay taxes. <laughs> Very flexible. Yeah. It's ironic because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, his article about Seabiscuit elicited a response from a reader of The Courier. This was written by Barbara Gray, and uh, the title of, of her piece is called Seabiscuit is Just a Movie. <laughs> yes, <laughs> That's right. Barbara. <laughs> Hell yeah, Barbara. It is just a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, this is actually like a pretty good piece. She, Here's the opening. I often feel slightly annoyed when I read Dennis Clayson's column on Sunday <laughs> afternoons. <laughs> and then uh, she apparently was old enough that she actually lived through some of the New Deal programs. So she uh, she writes a pretty good defense saying, yeah, actually, these did help people. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. And she ends the piece with, perhaps Mr. Clayson should try an experiment. For 30 days, he could walk around with no money in his pockets and live on a diet of soup and bread once a day. He wouldn't have the luxury of thinking about propaganda. He'd be thinking about food. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love Barbara. Hell yeah, yeah, Barbara. What a queen. Yeah, I agree with her, and it's a much funnier piece than Dennis is right. Yeah. <laughs> just a movie is an incredible title (laughs) yeah (laughs) fucking cool your jets clayson (laughs) i love call like calling them like fucking babies and snow like snowflake types like yeah it's usually true like just like imagine caring about any like it's like it's in direct it's well yeah it's like i don't know it's in direct contradiction to be like Oh, I'm my own person and I'm not influenced by anything, but then they're like hand wringing about fucking sea biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I liked that response. So I as I was scrolling through all of the pieces of his that are on the courier website, there's like a period where their archives are missing a bunch. So there's just a series of articles that mention his name. So I was just reading like a bunch of uh responses to his columns, just all one after the other. And uh, you're going to love a lot of these headlines. Columnist misses point. <laughs> Criticism for a columnist Clayson. Clayson, reason I get courier. So that's one positive. Clayson offers no ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers deserve better. <laughs> uh, criticism for Clayson. Brickbats for Clayson. Do we know what, what br- brickbats means? No idea. Brick bats? I looked it up and I forgot already. Um, a, a remark or comment which is highly critical and typically insulting. <laughs> yeah! So that one must have been particularly <laughs> aggressive. Uh, listen to teachers. Clayson out of line. Wrong conclusions. Clayson comparison off. Clayson wrong again. What is Clayson's <laughs> problem? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> Uh, Clayson column inaccurate. Clayson still wrong. <laughs> Logic <laughs> eludes Clayson. <laughs> nice. I like that one. <laughs> uh, Clayson should do research. <laughs> Send Clayson to Iraq. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I love the people of the Cedar Valley. It turns out, <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. Uh, disturbing opinion. <laughs> Chinese can keep Clayson. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, that's right. Because he he went to China and saw oh. a Chinese guy. Remember? Yeah, yeah. He's visited <laughs> visited China a few times, I think, and written about how their society is like so much yeah. more disciplined than ours. <laughs> Uh, empty rhetoric, terrible column. <laughs> Clayson confused. 
just throwing haymakers at him. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very funny to be scrolling and then suddenly it's just like one after another. <laughs> just constant <laughs> criticism. Arrogance in practice. Ridiculous examples. <laughs> Waste of space. <laughs> This is just getting kind of mean, really. Sounds like they got their money's worth with Kevin Clayson as a columnist. Yeah, I mean, yeah it's true. Lots you just, of have, just hire the <laughs> dumbest dipshit to write articles <laughs> and just watch the money just trickle in at a very slow pace. <laughs> it definitely pays, Since yeah. you're running a newspaper in the 21st century. <laughs> uh, Clayson goes off the deep end. Clayson is a sore loser. <laughs> yeah. That one was shortly after the 2008 election. <laughs> okay, well, Clayson wrote a few columns in response to all of his critics, just like a general, like, here's what I have to say to people who criticize me. This was the first one that I could find, but believe me, he he used several of his uh, weekly column spaces to... Well, yeah, he's the person back. who would read every single tweet about him. Clayson name searches. <laughs> well, oh, remember, yeah. he only reads criticism if there's a real name attached. Don't all columnists read? I mean, every columnist I know of loves to name search and loves when you talk <laughs> about them. I think that's the point of sharing your opinions. Yeah. So here's a response he wrote in 2006. Readers who offer counter arguments fit several patterns. When a person renders an opinion... Many times, it will elicit a response. We teach in our classes that people respond to an argument with agreement, counter-argument, or name-calling. But in reality, it is actually a bit more complicated. Wow. Of course, those who agree with me are simply correct. (laughs) (laughs) And those who disagree with me are commies. Yes, they're bad. And uh, name-calling doesn't even warrant a response, but... Over time, I have noticed several patterns in those who render counter-arguments. The most elementary are the scribblers. And he's wearing a Sherlock Holmes outfit as he discusses this. (laughs) These people don't like what you wrote, so they scribble out something on a piece of paper and mail it to you. In all honesty, I don't know what their arguments are because I've never been able to decipher the scrawl that graces these communications. So it seems some people have Dennis's home address. (laughs) (laughs) A slightly more sophisticated version of the scribblers are those who send emails that say, you are an idiot. (laughs) The best way to interact with people. (laughs) This is drive-by farting. (laughs) And the writer then copies several articles onto their email that are apparently supposed to make some point. Somehow, this is supposed to be very persuasive, especially if I had ESP. What? what? Does you know. know what that is? (laughs) <laughs> I know I know what that is. I no, no, I know you like, know, but I'm saying does he know what that is? Yeah. <laughs> oh, does he know what that is? Yeah. I thought yeah. you were asking me, and I was like, yeah. Boy, I need to be able to read minds to understand your arguments. You oh, dipshit. okay. <laughs> uh, for some reason, many of the scribblers are bush haters. Oh, hold on. I thought you said you couldn't understand the scribblers, Dennis. Already undermining oh, your own points gotcha. here. Owned I've by caught your own you. logic. <laughs> King me. As a professor, shouldn't you be really good at deciphering bad handwriting? <laughs> you'd think you'd have experience. Yeah. I don't even have to say anything positive about the president to motivate their responses. Just not saying anything negative is motivation enough. Yeah, yes. Bush, Bush was pretty bad. Can't blame he him. He was bad enough, I would say that's true. <laughs> uh, the second group is the people who are marginally educated. <laughs> i.e. they have an education but have never learned the distinction between feelings, opinions, hypotheses, statistical findings, and facts. Pretend I did a Ben Shapiro voice there. (laughs) To them, it is all one big relativistic soup. (laughs) They typically make an argument that goes something like this. I don't like what you said, therefore you are wrong, and by the way, you were really nasty to bring it up. Oh, their feelings are hurt. (laughs) Pussy. (laughs) <laughs> uh, 10 years ago they would have said that I was mean spirited but progressives no longer use that term after Thomas Sowell pointed out that mean spirited actually meant nothing except that one disagreed with a liberal who is that anybody know who Thomas <laughs> Sowell is no Thomas Towel <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, Sowl, Sowl. Oh, um, it's like, is that one of the characters that he made up and he's going to miss? <laughs> oh, okay. I've seen uh, pictures of this guy. He is, he's like a black conservative guy. Oh, okay. great. He, he was an economist. 
he worked at Stanford, I believe. Oh, he was a God, professor. what a cocktail of fucking... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, God, yeah. he's going to love this guy. So I'm not really familiar with any of Thomas Sowell's writing, of course, but uh, Dennis does refer to him several times. I just didn't uh, read those articles on the show. So he's a big fan of Mr. Sowell. Uh, this group contains a lot of educators. The response is also common among liberals who live in a cultural bubble and have never had to defend themselves. <laughs> Oh, that's terrible. People who live in cultural bubbles and don't have to defend themselves. <laughs> Couldn't be me. No, no. They typically add that they are offended. Somehow, simply stating this is supposed to close off all debate. <laughs> Since this group is always offended by something, one wonders what being offended has to do with anything except as some gauge of the assumed correctness of the marginally informed. He is bitching so much right now i love bitching so it's well he got some mean letters he got some mean letters he got some mean emails the third group consists of those who redefine what you say and then attack their own redefinition as if you have said it hmm (laughs) has dennis ever done that (laughs) made some shit up and then attacked it (laughs) uh this group is hard to evaluate because the response is a purposeful tactic of the propagandist or just the rambling of someone who can't read well A fourth group is a variant of the third. These are the folks who have an issue or in the vernacular an axe to grind. Blah, blah, blah. I don't really want to read more of this. Oh, yeah, it's terrible for someone to have an axe to grind. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to read more of this, honestly. But uh, just know that it's significantly longer than any of the other articles I read today. So this is a particularly motivating uh, thing. He was on one. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As with most people, it's it's the haters who really motivate his writing. <laughs> the haters and the losers. Mm-hmm. So I've touched on Clayson's writing uh, at the end of the Clinton administration, a little bit from the Bush administration. Uh, we have, on previous episodes, covered some of his writing from the past few years as Trump was president, but there's one hole left to fill. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what do we think uh, Clayson thought about President Barack Obama? <laughs> I'm sure it didn't drive him insane in the slightest or more insane. <laughs> yeah, uh, we did get a taste of that with that one response that called him a sore loser. We can guess from that uh, how his mm. writing must have been shortly after the 2008 election. I did see a piece of his uh, praising Sarah Palin, but didn't really warrant an appearance on the show. <laughs> Well, here's something he wrote in August 2009. This is another biting piece of satire entitled, A Look at Obama's Third Term. Again, we are, what, uh, a little over six months into his first term, (laughs) and already Dennis is talking about Obama's violation of constitutional norms. In he's definitely not mad or future. owned at all. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put it in the newspaper that he's owned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whatever you Obama's do. Obama's secret police are coming for my ass again. <laughs> Here's my column. <laughs> it's the drill tweet, but he's like pleading with himself not to write about how mad he is <laughs> in the newspaper. <laughs> Please stop me from saying in the newspaper that I got mad. (laughs) Uh, Since there is so little distinction between reality and satire in modern politics, I'm required to inform you that the rest of this article is fiction. Is this the freaking onion? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Two weeks ago, I wrote about my visit to the 105-year-old professor of social science, Dr. Maddie Maddox, who informed me of the conditions that would exist in 2016. (laughs) The 105-year-old scientist also added, please just let me die already. (laughs) (laughs) This is another one of his colorful characters. Late this week and late at night, I was working to improve the education of Iowa youths when there came a rapping (laughs) on my window. (laughs) This is incredible. I love it. I love it so much. (laughs) He has such a good imagination. (laughs) Truly wasted. (laughs) Looking up, I saw a large black raven. With some trepidation, I let it in. Oh, it's an illusion. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh. The raven flew over my head and landed on a bust of Ronald Reagan. (laughs) 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 This is uh, the Edgar Allan Poe of the 21st century here, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) It looked like a demon in the pallid light of my computer screen, but it never spoke. Not even to say, never more. Oh, all right. Well, I mean, we could have made the connection ourselves, but uh, I'm doing Edgar Allan Poe, everyone. Hey, 
<laughs> this is a parody of Poe. There was a note attached to its leg. Opening it, I found a message from Maddie. All it said was, bring a cheeseburger. They've banned cheeseburgers under <laughs> yeah. Obama's America. In my future, beef is outlawed. <laughs> uh, I found my way back to the basement of the social science building and, pushing the cobwebs away, found Dr. Maddox at her desk reading John Rawls. This time I had brought the largest triple cheese on the market. Uh, John Rawls. There's another name I don't think I know. Anybody? John I, Rawls? Yeah, I haven't heard no, of that. sorry. Wait, I think this is the guy that Matt Brunig uses as his Twitter profile picture. <laughs> Uh, John Rawls was an American moral and political philosopher in the liberal tradition. Maddie gave me a look that chilled my heart. Want to know more, don't you, Sonny? She asked with a wicked smile. I nodded. Maddie removed the bun and looked deep into the entrails of the burger. (laughs) She looked shocked for a moment, but gained her composure and began to talk in a low monotone. So I guess the burger is how she sees into the future? Weird. (laughs) Here's what she saw in 2018. Obama is now in his third term. When he ran for re-election in 2016, some traditionalists protested and somehow got their case to the Supreme Court. Writing for the majority, Justice Sonia Sotomayor found that the 22nd Amendment did not apply to any member of a protected class who had suffered past discrimination. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god. This is... Given uh, given the advantage of hindsight, this is very funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so new, Sonia Sotomayor, the only like non-white person on the Supreme Court. <laughs> They're coming for white men. Yeah, and given how we know the Supreme Court actually ended up in the year 2018. <laughs> where Oh, I forgot about Clarence Thomas, damn. Oh, right. Uh, Dennis actually got everything he could have ever dreamed of in the years after he wrote this. Uh, At a news conference, both Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid agreed that the 22nd Amendment had never actually existed. Uh, Pundits at both CNN and the New York Times looked up the Constitution on Wikipedia and reported that Pelosi and Reid were completely correct. (laughs) Fucking journalistic standards gone down the tubes. Wow. After the election... Jesus. Obama had praised the patriotic citizens of New Jersey and Chicago, who came out to vote for him in record numbers. In both places, the vote for Obama exceeded the population by over 130%. Ooh, he's early to the voter fraud train. Well, that's always been a thing. (laughs) They were talking about dead people voting in Chicago way back. And I mean, it actually was happening, so there was a kernel of truth to it. And the Illinois Democratic Party is deeply corrupt. So again, a kernel of truth. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Last year, Californians passed a resolution to leave the United States and become part of Mexico. The plan had to be scrapped when Mexico refused to accept the once golden state. (laughs) In 2018, Texas and Alaska seceded from the Union. Following in the steps of Abraham Lincoln, Obama responded by having 786,512 people arrested. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Yeah, I wonder if Dennis has interesting thoughts on the Civil War, (laughs) given this. (laughs) Sure he does. (laughs) He then declared war on Texas and Alaska over the objection of some who maintained that only Congress could declare war but Obama clarified the issue by saying that immediate action was needed. Congress passed a resolution praising the president for his toughness in facing down constitutional reactionaries. Okay, again, this is right off of the heels of George W. Bush. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What the fuck? (laughs) You supported the Iraq war, Dennis. Uh, Plans to invade Texas and Alaska had to be put on hold when the troops refused to participate and when it was learned that Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner had made secret visits to the new countries, begging them to buy more of the federal debt. (laughs) (laughs) Timothy Geithner, okay. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) That's, uh, yeah. Not definitely a status quo fucking person at all. Like, right. what is... Yeah. I, it's This is just insane. <laughs> global cooling continues, now called global change. <laughs> so climate change? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oranges that once grew in Florida now have to be found in other workers' paradises, such as Cuba. Uh, 
Are you saying that with or without irony? (laughs) (laughs) Unironically, yes. So it seems he has become a bit more reactionary when it comes to environmental concerns. Uh, Top scientists at both the Obama administration and the UN are seeking ways to put soot between the earth and the sun to block more sunlight before global change kills somebody somewhere. (sighs) They warned that otherwise the earth will continue to warm to unacceptable levels. Wow, real satire there. Jeez. After three cases of the flying pig flu, which is a combination of swine and the bird flu, were reported in the United States. Eh, That is kind of funny, I guess. (laughs) Combining the swine and bird flu into the flying pig flu. Like, it's not laugh out loud funny, but at least it's... It's a clear uh, attempt at humor. It has the cadence of humor. He should go to an open mic night. <laughs> yes, he should. That would rock. I would go. I would love that, yeah. Uh, the World Health Organization declared the new disease a pandemic, allowing immediate UN help over any objection of provincial local governments. <laughs> wow. God damn. He foreshadowed. Really well. yeah, yeah, he knew exactly how coronavirus is going to play out. It's amazing. <laughs> so much uh, hindsight. Just It adds so much to this piece. Uh, the president uh, calmed fears by reminding everyone that health care is totally free. Yay. <laughs> this is just a glimpse of Dennis Clayson's uh, satirical predictions for the year 2018. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Could not have been more wrong on every Everything. fucking point. <laughs> Incredible. Like, the most wrong any piece of satire has ever been. <laughs> And that's how it ends. And honestly, let's let's say that that's the end of Dennis Clayson entirely. We will probably never have any reason to think or discuss him again. His legacy does live on in the name of the Toxic Feminine Mystique premium series from Rock Art Caucus. But other than that, no one will be subjected to Dennis Clayson's terrible writing ever. We'll again. see. He doesn't have any books. Uh, he does have a book about fishing. Which I, oh, believe we, lovely. I believe we <laughs> okay. have mentioned at one point. I bet you he could probably come up with some pretty deranged shit in a book about fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll have some good asides in there, you know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe someday I could be convinced to read it. Yeah, control F for <laughs> the cancel culture. The DNR is coming for me. <laughs> <laughs> Something about permits. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, there was something in one of his. Uh, it might have been in that bit I read about energy, but skipped over it. There was something about how environmentalists think that the survival of certain species of fish is more important than uh, meeting our energy production needs. Hmm. See, everything has a personal <laughs> grievance somewhere yeah. in there. You don't know it necessarily, <laughs> but. Every single thing. And I I support it, honestly, because I would love to have a column where I just get to do all my personal grievances. But you can't really extrapolate anything larger from that. Natalie, you've <laughs> expressed your desire to have that several times on the show. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have. Been talking about this. <laughs> Every time I just think about how I would love to have a petty column. In the, <laughs> the only way you can pull it off, though, is if you have you have to have zero self awareness. Like, oh, true, you're right. otherwise yeah. you just get you're like, what am I doing? Like, you get too embarrassed. I'm embarrassing myself. <laughs> yeah, like who is this for? <laughs> And he can't get paid that yeah, like he can't get paid that well for this. Yeah, I'm sure it's not like amazing pay, but when you do it for twenty five years, he's probably yeah, built up a yeah. decent decent savings account off of these columns. <laughs> <laughs> uh well we we certainly don't uh, restrict ourselves from any of our own petty grievances on this program. So <laughs> we do have a bit of an outlet for that, at least. <laughs> uh but that's Dennis Clayson for you. That's our tribute to the long career of uh conservative columnist here in our great state and i'm sure there will be more coming (laughs) that are just (laughs) like him in the future we may have lost one but there are many to take his place but there's only one adam sullivan yep (laughs) it's just like whack-a-mole with these freaks i think it'd be very funny if adam sullivan wrote an article about his haters (laughs) yeah i don't think he's really done that yes funny tweet at him (laughs) (laughs) well i think we can end things there uh is there any other information we need to get out to the people? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's lots of things we could talk about, but 
Uh, well, uh, we we kind of opened the show with this, but I will say again that the last episode of Toxic Feminine Mystique is very funny, like <laughs> one of the funniest things we've ever produced. So if you're not on the Patreon, I would recommend it. Uh, if, if you can't afford $1 a month, I know money is often tight for a lot of us. If you want to hear it, just fucking DM me. I'll send it to you. <laughs> no, don't do that. This podcast isn't for broke boys. There's a reason we yeah. hide the good stuff behind the paywall. This, exactly. This The whole podcast is a front just so that people would pay to hear Stelly, Stella, and Natalie. Stelly. <laughs> you should you should really subscribe because we have some more good parodies coming up. So you should subscribe. We're always doing parodies. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just, we're still oat pack or I'm sorry, we're still rock cock pack, pack, cock pack, pack whatever the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Whoops, I missed the luncheon. Um, I recorded an episode with Alan yesterday where a, a lot of parody songs came up. Actually, so if if you're a fan of discussions of parody. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> plenty of stuff for you to enjoy at patreon.com slash rock hard caucus we've also got some like cool guest stuff coming up but we don't really have a concrete timeline for that so stay subscribed to the regular podcast and you'll hear stuff that's a lot more interesting and important yeah we'll talk Dennis about Clayson serious in, stuff in again future. at some point yeah yeah you know we do a couple episodes about serious stuff and then we just dunk on a shitty opinion columnist <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know when i saw he was retiring we just had to give him his due today he's pretty entertaining i mean he's got some he's got some real real heaters of takes there <laughs> that sea biscuit thing was a great <laughs> yeah. incredible I'm, that was my favorite i'm glad i discovered that <laughs> all right well i think that's all then thanks for listening to rock art caucus and have a good one goodbye goodbye